Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Zoom call. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of questions that were submitted today, so hopefully you guys have questions. It's going to be a short Zoom call. All right, let's get started. All right. Just a reminder to everybody to look at the <clears throat> member site for any new information, anything new coming on board. Also a reminder to make sure you look at the courses. Um, a lot of benefit to the courses <clears throat> and to um, uh, new blog posts as well. <clears throat> Got a couple of new people on today. You can use the chat on your Zoom to chat in questions. So just chat in a question if you have a question that you couldn't ask prior to the Zoom call. Remember also to self-schedule if you need to do so, you need to talk to me specific. Lee, when you get to this self-schedule thing and you click on it, you will give be given a choice whether you want to just schedule a regular phone call or if you want to schedule a Zoom call. The only time you really want to schedule a Zoom call is if you're sending me labs and you want to go over labs or that we got labs back that we want to go over. Doing a Zoom call could be helpful because then I can share my screen and you'll see my pointer. And as I'm talking about this thing right here, you know, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So I don't have to say see on page one, up upper left hand corner, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so doing a Zoom call to go over labs can be helpful. All right, let's get started. Curious about glutathione. Should most breast cancer patients include this with their supplement regimen? Um, um, I would say no. So the pros and cons of glutathione. So glutathione is your main, your primary intracellular inside the cell, antioxidant. So um, <clears throat> you have processes of oxidation and antioxidation going on in your body, extracellularly, meaning outside the cell, and intracellularly, um, inside the cell. So the glutathione is your main intracellular antioxidant. It's made in the cell and... Um, and you, and it's, um, and it breaks down oxidizing agents that enter into the cell. Now, whenever you listen and read about oxidizing agents, you think of them as, um, poisons or bad guys, things that oxidize cells can cause cancer. So that's true. So any, a, a poison or a toxin is an oxidizing agent and it is um it's cancer causing it can damage cell membranes it can damage the nucleus of the cell and if it damages the nucleus of the cell it can be a cause for cancer um by oxidizing the amino acids in the in the um dna it can damage the dna so oxidizing agents can be damaging however there's a balance to that. Everything in, in physiology has a balance. Your body actually makes reactive oxygen species for the purpose of killing biotoxins. So when you have a biotoxin, let's say you have you know, a bacteria or a virus, your body will make reactive oxygen, reactive oxygen species to kill that virus or kill that bacteria. So it's all about balance. So remember that. So I know we live in a world where you read a lot about antioxidants and you should be taking a lot of antioxidants. Well, there may be truth to that. Taking a lot of antioxidants can be helpful because we're exposed to so many oxidizing agents and pesticides, chemicals, heavy metals, toxins, mycotoxins, all these things are oxidizing agents. So trying to balance out the amount of oxidizing agents that are damaging our cell or have a potential of causing cancer with taking some extra antioxidants can be helpful. However, if um, you're trying to kill cancer, um, you have to keep that balance that you're not 
using too many oxidizing agents because sometimes your body uses reactive oxygen species to help kill cancer cells. That's exactly how chemotherapy works. Chemotherapy is uh, uh, an oxidizing agent and cancer cells to be tend to be more prone to damage to oxidizing agents than a healthy cell does. Be partly because a healthy cell is healthy because the components of the cell are doing their job. And glutathione is a component that's recycled within the cell. So you don't actually need any exogenous glutathione. A healthy person not exposed to excess oxidizing agents does not need to take glutathione as a supplement. Why? Because glutathione is recycled inside the cell. It's oxidized and reduced through a process of recycling inside the cell. So yeah, it does need, you know, the nutrients in order to do that. Um, and um, so, you know, taking some nutrients that can help that, but typically an average person would get that in their diet as well. So why would a person take glutathione? It's all because they're realizing that they're exposed to a lot of oxidizing agents. So they want to support the glutathione pathway. Um, why wouldn't a person take glutathione? If you're doing chemotherapy, if you're doing another oxidizing agent, like there's different supplements that are that kill cancer through the process of oxid oxidization. Protocell is one of those things. So you don't take glutathione when you're taking protocell. And, um, you know, you got to keep that balance. So I only tell cancer patients to take glutathione if it tests on the cheek swab that it's okay for them to take it. If you're reading my book, I'm not so positive on glutathione with cancer because you are you know, cancer, cancer cells are more prone to die through oxidation. And if you are, you could actually be keeping cancer cells alive by taking glutathione. So I only tell people, I only recommend glutathione with people that it tests well with. Otherwise, I don't suggest glutathione. And I don't suggest excess antioxidants with cancer patients unless it tests well. So Lots of times in the in the natural world, if you go to a a, a, natu a naturopath or a chiropractor or some natural doctor who's who's reading literature about you know other health conditions, and then you have been a patient of theirs, and now you get you know you get a diagnosis of cancer, and that person is helping you, but they don't really have a specialty in cancer, they may put you on high dose antioxidants. And that might not be the right thing to do. So there's some things that you would normally, that, that could be helpful for you from a nutritional standpoint if you don't have cancer. And those same things might not be the right thing to take if a person does have cancer. So it was a very long 10 minute answer to the question, should most breast cancer patients include this with their supplement regimen? The answer is no. And the reason is, is that you may be keeping cancer cells alive by taking glutathione, or you may be counteracting an oxidative therapy that you're doing, either chemotherapy or some nutritional in, uh, oxidative therapy. So the answer to this short answer is just no. Lately, I thought I was taking too many supplements. So I decided uh, uh, to take the EstroClear, AromaClear, and Sulforazine three times a day, every day. And my osteopath and other osteopaths recommendations and other vitamins every other day. Do you see any downside for this? So this person, I know the person who asked this question and they are doing fantastic with their cancer. They would, you could say they're in complete remission. Um, so I am all together in favor of doing this. This would be called pulsing. 
So pulsing your supplements is that you're taking some time off. Maybe you take them five days a week and off on the weekends, or you could do it every other day, just like this. I think that would be fine, especially if you're in a good position health-wise um, to, to do some pulsing. Are there any vitamins you would recommend that must be taken daily instead of every other day? I think you're making the right decision. And I think we talked about this on a call. These are things that you're taking to reduce um, bad estrogens. So that would be something that you do want to take on a daily basis. Other things you could take, um, you could separate out. Other things you might want to take on a daily basis are like in the summertime, if you're sweating a lot, you might want to stay on minerals. Um, things that you could pulse very easily would be your fat-soluble vitamins, your A and E and and D uh, and K. Those are things that store well in your body. The water-soluble nutritional things, you know, tend to not store well. Things that maybe you'd want to take on a daily basis, maybe it might make you might make a decision based upon comorbidities let's say i may have inflammation so you want to stay on anti-inflammatories the flavonoids on a daily basis then i wouldn't suggest pulsing and doing this on somebody that's you know is not got a clean bill of health and and doing great so stay to your protocol at that point Recently had good results with latest MRI. Appears resection margins are clean now and tumor reduced in size from 10 centimeters to 1.8 centimeters. This person had surgical resection. Plus suspect lymph nodes are now are not visible on latest CT scan and minimal on the MRI. Getting another MRI next week for additional detail based on radiologist recommendation. It appears that the oncologist still recommends four to six sessions of port-based Fulfox or just 5-FU. I understand this is to weaken cancer cells and to prevent distant metastasis, yet this is also something that's going to weaken the immune system and does not kill cancer stem cells. When I ask, they say it's all about the immune system. It's not all about the immune system. Thoughts on general on the chemo process. I just don't want to take unnecessary risks. Not sure what strategy is more risky either. Okay, so my thoughts on doing uh, chemo. If the if you had a debulking procedure where the cancer was encapsulated and they're able to basically get the entire capsule, knowing full well that there's probably circulating tumor cells elsewhere, that would not be a reason to do chemo. Like you have circulating tumor cells, we, there's no cancer, your PET scan is completely clean. Should a person do chemo at that point? Yeah, that's real questionable. In this case, you know that there's still some cancer that's present. It's 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 smaller. You know, it's still there's still some there. I would be more apt to say, okay, I've gone this far to do the resection, resection. You know, I would be maybe willing to start to do the chemo process and see how you do. Remember, some people, depending genetically on their detoxification pathways and the health of their liver, they could just sail right through this. And, and you know, they have been, those are the people that have fantastic results with the chemo and it did its job because you were able to get it out of the body before it was able to damage any healthy cells. How are you gonna know that? Well, the only way that you're gonna know that you know that is to do one session at a time. So, um, you know, of course I would pray about it. Of course I would, you know, give as much consideration as possible, but I wouldn't, you know, completely rule it out. So my opinion, you're getting multiple people's opinion. My opinion, I wouldn't rule it out. This could, you know, really put an end to the your your struggle that you had up to this point by doing maybe only a couple sessions. Um, at maybe maybe make a deal with the oncologist. Say, hey, I'll be willing to agree session at a time here. How I how I do with it. If I do well with the first session, I'll move on to the second session. If you'll be willing to take another scan after three sessions. 
um, something like that. I mean, that seems reasonable. Um, because honestly, if you said, well, why are you recommending four to six sessions? Uh, the sessions, he's going to say, well, that's is the bottom line is we because that's what is recommended by the pharmaceutical company. They might say, well, that's what we've done and we've had great results. If you if you pushed that and said, have you ever done three sessions? I mean, they wouldn't have an answer. Um, so the truth is, is that, you know, 90% of the people just do what they tell them to do. So they don't test. You know, there is no test whether only one session is good or two sessions are good or you know, who's, who came up with the four to six sessions? The pharmaceutical company. So there's nothing wrong with giving some pushback. You know, hey, I'm willing to use my brain here that, yeah, some chemo could really knock down what's left. But, you know, I'm, I'm the one that's in control of my body and I'll decide when I want to stop. But I would like objective testing. Are you willing to do another MRI or CT scan? That's what I would say. What are your thoughts on nicotine and its effect on cancer? Regarding cancer in infrared saunas, can I go to a local tanning facility that offers infrared saunas or do I need to go elsewhere? Your input is appreciated. So this one, yeah, you can go to a local tanning facility that offers infrared saunas. That's just fine. I don't see any problem with that. Um, you know, there's not toxins or anything that you're going to pick up at a local tanning facility doing a sauna. So I don't see any issue with that. This, I think, is a completely separate question. Nicotine and its effect on cancer. Well, at first glance, I mean, nicotine, you know, is a major cause of uh, lung cancer. And that's still the number, I think it's the number one deadly cancer is um, small cell lung cancer. Um, but in truth, it's more probably the chemicals that they put in tobacco and not necessarily the nicotine. They, I mean, they put addictive forming chemicals in tobacco. So tobacco today is very different than tobacco maybe back in the 1800s. So tobacco is sprayed with addictive for, uh, addiction forming chemicals in order to get people to be addicted to it, to continue to buy their tobacco. That that is probably the most carcinogen uh, aspect of tobacco. Um, uh, so, but in truth, nicotine is still uh, probably should be considered a toxic substance. Um, I don't think it should be consumed. Um, people will say, well, tobacco is just a natural substance. I mean, it's God made it. Yeah, but I don't think we're supposed to smoke it. Just because God made it doesn't mean we're supposed to smoke it just because God made rocks doesn't mean we're supposed to eat them. You know, so you can't use that excuse with, with something that's consumed. So, you know, I don't know if your question really has to do with secondhand smoke and its effect on uh, our sarcoma. I, I don't know of any studies on that. I would definitely say that nicotine is a toxin. It isn't good for anybody. Um, so, uh, but if it's, you're dealing with secondhand smoke, it's, you're, you're dealing with a lot more toxins than just the nicotine that's in that smoke. So it's highly, um, you know, toxic substance. Okay, questions from the chat. We are needing to replace carpet in our house. I've heard there could be some toxic outgassing with new carpeting. Do you have any concerns or recommendations about new carpeting and how to impact someone with cancer? Well, there's definitely toxic outgassing with all new carpet. Um, carpet is obviously made with, you know, as a chemical, and many carpets are sprayed with fire retardants. Can't remember the name of the fire retardant, but that is a major neurotoxin in itself. Um, and so, yeah, it, you know, but you know, going the route of a natural wool-based carpet. Um, to be extremely expensive and doesn't necessarily wear well and it's not very stain resistant at all my son put in a in their nursery he put in a um, wool based carpet that was expensive and it just it did not it was horrible actually 
Um, as far as wear and and stain resistance goes, it was just it was just just a, they just said it was a, just a big mistake. So you know what do you do? Maybe wait till the summertime where you can open up all the windows and turn the fans on and try to, you know, get that stuff out of your house. Um, I can't remember who it was. Some uh, some movie star years ago. I had a video of hers. Uh, her and her husband had a son, and he ended up with a severe neurotoxic. Uh, disease diagnosis. They said he was um, mentally retarded at the time with some strange neurotoxic disease. They ended up detoxing him, going to actually a chiropractor out in California, did detoxing. The chiropractor did kinesiology on him and found out that it was a he was uh, he was toxic with the fire uh, the fire retardant chemical, I believe, and some other chemicals did complete detoxing. They tore all the carpet out of their house. The sun got better. Um, and they wrote multiple articles about it in living, trying to have a clean house. So a perfectly clean house then would not include any carpeting and would all be hardwoods or tile. And um, but that's just not real practical. I mean, they oh, will use throw rugs. Well, the throw rugs have chemicals in them too. I mean, it's it's just difficult to balance that out. We certainly don't do that. We have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in areas of our house. We have some wood in areas of our house and obviously tile in the bathrooms. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. I mean, uh, some people are going to have more issues with that. And it all depends upon different sensitivities. It depends on if they have damage to brain cells already and they have microglial priming, they're going to be more sensitive to those type of chemicals. If they have compromise to their liver detox pathways, they're going to have a difficulty getting that stuff out. They're going to be more susceptible, just like people are more susceptible to different toxins based upon, you know, the level of toxicity that they're dealing with right now. And certainly if they're dealing with, uh, with cancer or some other, you know, a more uh, comorbidity so yeah you just have to find a balance maybe it's like okay well we're just gonna do it in the summertime and you know try to open the windows and leave the fans blowing and try to just maybe maybe get the carpets cleaned even after we get them put in always when you get your carpets cleaned you should clean with just hot water alone never any soap or chemicals ever 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 when you get carpets cleaned um, there's services now that do that, um, or you do it yourself, rent a carpet cleaner, or do it yourself, just with hot as water as you can possibly get. Um, I used to have a patient years ago that had a carpet cleaning service and he just cleaned carpets with boiling water and, um, and she just got great results, never used anything, but the stuff that he pulled out of carpets, the cleaning solution that was left behind from other cleaners was amazing. So maybe try that. That's another, you know, possible solution to get some of that stuff out. A couple of years ago, I had a doctor friend of mine whose son, his 12-year-old son or something, was having major neurotoxic issues. I tested him. He tested positive for, for fire-retarded chemicals. And I said, I don't know what this is. It's fire-retarded chemicals. Do you have any idea where he's getting that? Um this was years ago before I knew anything about really fire retarded chemicals. And he said, well, yeah, we just got a brand new couch um, and he's been sleeping on the couch. So all he did is change where he's sleeping and all the symptoms went away. Plus he took some supplements to help detox it. So these things can be major issues. All new furniture you buy has that stuff in it. Uh, all baby clothes have that stuff in it. That's why my kids typically buy these natural, you know, uh, organic cotton baby clothes, even though they're more expensive. You don't want to put that garbage on your little baby. So, um, yeah, it's just a matter of trying to strike a balance. Do you test everyone for glutathione? My genetic tests show problems with my glutathione production. Yes, I do test everyone for glutathione. So if I didn't put you on glutathione, um, you're, you shouldn't be on glutathione. So that's just my opinion. My hematocrit is 33.9, range is 35 to, uh, 30, to 45. 
why is this low and what can be done? Well, there could be multiple reasons why your hematocrit can be low. You'd want to look at that along with your red blood cell count. Um, and um, your, uh, your other uh, CBC values. Um, so uh, I, I'd want to look at your look at the rest of your CBC. So um, yeah, you don't look at just one blood value alone. So you want to look at the rest of the CBC. Should I have clarified, I should have clarified a nicotine. Nicotine therapy talks about nicotine patches and possibly using organic nicotine uh, SNUS to help with cancer management reduction. Your thoughts? Well, I'm not familiar with that. Um, so I, 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 I don't have an answer to that. I don't, I don't know. I've not ever used that. I've not even heard of that. So, um, I guess I don't have an answer for that. I apologize. There's something else to look into. So red blood cells and hemoglobin are also on the lower side. So then that tells us that you are quite possibly anemic. So hematocrit is, um, is um, measures the percentage of volume of red blood cells in a centrifuge uh, contents of blood. So it's the part of the CBC that you look at the red blood cells, um, your hemoglobin, um, your red cell width, and such, and, and your uh, M, uh, mean, corpus uh, mean corpuscular volume and your serum ferritin and your total iron binding capacity to help determine if you have anemia. So if it's low, you could have uh, iron deficiency anemia. You could have vitamin B12 anemia. You could have anemia due to blood loss. Um, uh, you could have anemia due to increased destruction, which is typically called anemia of chronic disease. So anemia in cancer patients is typically from what's called anemia of chronic disease. So, but I think you have been dealing with um, uh um, balancing on that anemia issue for a time. And wasn't it you that increased your red meat per, uh, consumption and that helped? Um, so you need different nutrients to be able to make red blood cells. You need to be able to support the production of red blood cells. But whenever you have uh, decreased red blood cells, decreased hemoglobin and um other factors of anemia, you do want to look at, do I have bleeding issues? Um, maybe it's because I'm a woman and I have heavy periods, so I'm losing blood that way. Am I making blood enough? Am I um, supporting, you know, um, blood production with my, with my diet? Am I fasting too much? Um, and what else could cause anemia damage because I did radiation, I'm doing chemotherapy. Um, uh, oxidizing agents can damage red blood cell production. So those are the, you want to look at causes of it. Make sure you investigate causes. Many times with stage four cancer patients, the cause really is that the cancer is just basically gobbling up um, red blood cells and gobbling up uh, iron and hemoglobin for oxygen. That's the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Um, and that's considered anemia of a chronic disease. And then you, you, you're always with cancer. You're always like, should I add iron supplementation? Because that could possibly feed cancer. Um, if I do that, I want to add artemisinin with it. Or should I just 
you know, if I'm just kind of at that border, should I just, you know, add more uh, maybe red meat and beets and foods that can help build blood back? Um, and that is always what you what you want to do as your first step um, before you add iron um, supplementation. You also want to look at ferritin. If your ferritin levels are high, then you don't want to add iron because then you know you have an inflammatory process. Um, remember I said B12 anemia can cause uh, anemia patterns as well. So a deficiency in B12. And remember your, gen your genetics also if you have defects on um, you know, MTHFR defects, MTR and MTRR defects. Those are genes on the, um, the folate pathway and the methionine pathway that can cause a deficiency in B12. Plus, if one of the commonly overlooked issues and causes of anemia is a decrease in production of intrinsic factor. Um, intrinsic factor is necessary for you to absorb B12. So you might even be taking B12, but you're not absorbing it, and you got a B12 anemia because of that. Well, why would you have a decrease in intrinsic factor? The number one reason why you'd have a decrease in intrinsic factor is uh, is hypochlorhydria. So you have a decreased hydrochloric acid production in your stomach. You need hydrochloric acid. You need an acidic stomach. In order to make it uh, intrinsic factor, you need an acidic stomach in order to absorb iron and to absorb B12. So, and remember, I've talked about on uh, this Zoom call and on uh, some videos about hydrochloric acid that that is the number one issue worldwide is, uh, is especially in America because of our poor American diet is damaged the cells, the parietal cells in the stomach that make hydrochloric acid. And the number one problem is a decreased hydrochloric acid. So taking hydrochloric acid um, and, and concurrently digestive enzymes with each meal can be the fix for anemia. So make sure that you're taking HCL with each meal and you're taking enough. Many times people aren't taking enough. So... Um, and with the size of the meal, you should take more. So that can be the fix for anemia. You know, I've you know, talked to people that don't have cancer that have suffered with anemia for decades and just fixing their stomach. Um, and hydrochloric acid production solves that problem. Um, and also people can have, you know, can suffer with symptoms from H. pylori for, for decades as well. So... Uh, that's always caused from um, and tied to uh, hypochlorhydria. So look at that. I actually have a video on, on hypochlorhydria and H. pylori and everything on the, the blog post. So make sure you look at those. When I use chloroxygen chlorophyll, the test comes good. I don't know what you mean by that. So... You take a, this product and then you run a blood test and it's normal. I'm not quite sure. Not sure. I'm not sure in a pathway with that. If that was true, then why don't you stay on that if that's solving the anemia issue? Um, might be affecting H. pylori. Maybe that's why I'm not quite sure the, the metabolic pathway of that. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, we will say goodbye for today. Remember to 
get your questions in or do like you guys all did such a great job today, chatting those questions in. Thank you for another great day. We'll get this up so anybody can listen to it if they missed. All right. God bless everybody. Bye-bye.